Okay. Good morning. Today is the 26th day of the first, uh, 26th, the 16th day of the first Adar, the 25th of February. And we're starting a new parsha, Parashat Kitisa. If you follow the morning Chassidut classes, so we've been, uh, for the past, I think, 10 sessions, something like that, we've been discussing very much in depth the Kabbalistic and Hasidic meaning behind the first uh, topic covered in our new parasha. And that topic is the half-shekel uh, donation or tax, two ways of seeing it. And there's... Well, let's, let's just explain what, what, what this is all about, okay? Um, so I'll, read, I'll just read the beginning of the uh, parsha and, and, and then move on to our topic. So continuing the instructions for the tabernacle, God spoke to Moses saying, in addition to the silver you will collect as part of the donations the people will give voluntarily towards the construction of the tabernacle, its furnishings and the priestly vestments. You will collect an additional sum from them when you count them. You will count them when you descend Mount, uh, Mount Sinai after Yom Kippur in order to know how many remain after the plague they suffered from making the golden calf. And again a month after the tabernacle is erected. Um, in both censuses, you shall count the people indirectly by collecting a poll tax, because counting them directly may make my attribute of justice as God reconsider whether they deserve to be so numerous. So, you will use the silver collected at the first of these censuses to make the bases for the tabernacle's planks and the hooks for its pillars. You will use the silver collected at the second of these censuses to purchase all the public communal offerings brought that year on the community's behalf. Therefore, when you take a census of the Israelites, by number each man shall give a monetary ransom for his soul when they are counted. This way there will not be a plague among them caused by the evil eye when they are counted. And God showed Moses a fiery coin weighing half a shekel and said, This is what everyone who passes through the line of those counted shall give a half shekel. And then... It says in verse 14, we're looking at Exodus 30, 14, whomever passes through the line of those counted for the purpose of conscription into the army. And you have to realize that here the army is not an army that was going to fight. That wasn't what was being discussed here. It was actually, it's called the army of the tabernacle. It's a, it's a completely different thing, but it, it's the same type of thing. It's public service. So here they're not going to war or anything like that, but it is public service for, and they call it for the tabernacle, which was really everything that they needed in order to set up their encampment in the wilderness. So whoever passes through the line of those counted for the purpose of conscription into the army, that is, every male 20 years old and over to the age of 60 shall give the contribution for God, meaning they shall give this half shekel. So this is a very interesting thing, that here is a mitzvah, a commandment, that on the face of it is not really connected in any way to communal service. It's not related to the army in and of itself. I mean, this half shekel is not used to do anything that's related to the communal service. So, so the, the thing that could be closest to it is because we just said, we explained that this is not talking about an army that's going to invade or do anything or, or make war. This is really the, it's called the hosts of the tabernacle in the Zohar. So we could connect it with the importance of building the um, planks that surrounded the tabernacle and that set it off from the rest of the camp. So you could say that basically the, the, by giving um, the half shekel for this cause, for the plan for the bases of the planks and for the pillars that held them up, that's what this silver was used for, and also some of it was used for um, for the vestments, for the for the uh, for, for the uh, clothing of the priests. But that was given on a different occasion. Then this has to do with setting up the camp. So this silver is related to that. So that's the closest you can come to saying that. It's very hard to understand why does the Torah here suddenly say from the age of 20 and on. Usually every commandment uh, becomes obligatory at the age of 13. So again, I said, 
maybe the explanation here is, like the Zohar wants to go in this direction, that what they were doing was setting up the encampment. And that was the communal side of it, and that's why it was from age 20 and on. But then there's a very interesting question that surfaces, which is this half shekel tax or donation wasn't given just once in the wilderness. It was given every single year. In fact, we still commemorate the giving of this half shekel. There's an entire tractate in the Talmud, in the Mishnah, and then in the Talmud. We don't have it in the Babylonian Talmud, but we have it in the Jerusalem Talmud. A very long, actually, <laughs> tractate that deals with everything, all the laws that have to do with this half shekel donation. Because it was given every year. What was, this, what was it given for? So we just said, you buy the communal offerings from it, meaning that all the sacrifices, the daily sacrifices, the sacrifice for Sabbath, for, um, for all the holidays, for the festivals, for Rosh Chodesh, for the beginning of the month, all these sacrifices were bought with the money from this half shekel donation that every male over the age of 20 gave. But again, the question is, what about the year after they were commanded here to do it from age 20? Does this commandment revert back to the normal 13 years of age obligation? And we find that there is a big dispute among the uh, uh, halachic authorities, the legal authorities. Some of them say, that it's uh, for, for posterity, it's, it goes back to age 13, and then you should bring it from age 13 and on. And some of them say, no, it, it should remain 20 forever. It's for all generations, it's from the age of 20. The most important of these uh, rule, uh, uh, authorities is the Gaon of Vilna. And the Gaon of Vilna writes that the Jerusalem Talmud, when it discusses this, makes it clear, in his opinion, makes it clear that for all ages you give it at 20. Uh, meaning throughout the ages, it's always at age 20. It never reverts back to 13. Uh, the way it was in the time of the first year that they came out of Egypt, that's the way it is forever. However, most of the other commentaries say that it's not that way, but we don't know where they get that from. So there's a very interesting thing here, and this is... Um, what I'm going to tell you now is something that's not known by great scholars of Talmud. They don't know the simple difference between the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud was, as its name implies, written in Babylon by the scholars, the sages who lived in Babylon. The Jerusalem Talmud was written in, mostly in Tiberias actually, but it was written in the land of Israel and it was actually completed a hundred years later than the Babylonian Talmud. It's of a very different style. The Aramaic is different. It's Syrian Aramaic. It's much harder to understand for most people who know Aramaic. Um, it ha it's not studied as much. But what is the essential difference between them? So in Kabbalah it's explained that the Jerusalem Talmud corresponds to what we call the mother principle, the consciousness of the sphera of understanding, the feminine. The, the Babylonian Talmud is more feminine in a sense. In fact, that's always true, that Jews living outside the land of Israel are more feminine. We see them as more accepting. What do we mean by that? That they are under the auspices, uh, under the authority of the nations by whom they live. And so in that sense, they're more feminine. They're receiving from those nations. They're receiving their sustenance from the, their, those nations, their livelihood. But the Jews living in the land of Israel, the Jerusalem Talmud, is called the mindset of the father principle. It's the consciousness of wisdom. It's the masculine type of intellect. And there, it's not um, receiving. It's always giving. It's always uh, affecting others. It's always being a light unto others. So this is a basic difference between these two Talmuds. There's a few hundred different uh, issues upon which the two Talmuds disagree. Uh, there's many of them, a few hundred, and some of them are well known. But what you can see throughout 
the entire span of these disputes is that they always are the difference between the masculine intellect and the feminine intellect. That the Jerusalem Talmud is always taking the Mochin de Abba, the father principle type of consciousness, and the Babylonian Talmud will always take the, fem- the feminine understanding, ima type of consciousness. Here we see the same thing. That the Gaon of Vilna says, the Jerusalem Talmud says it remains at the age of 20. In the Babylonian Talmud, it follows that it, rema- that it reverts back to the age of 13. 20 and 13 in the development of a person are considered to be the ages at which we attain the mother consciousness at 13, and then the father consciousness, the wisdom consciousness, at the age of 20. What's the difference between them? There's a lot of differences uh, in, in legalese. We won't talk about that. Let's just talk about what we just saw here. At the age of 13, a child becomes bar mitzvah, which means that he's obligated by the commandments. What do we mean that he's obligated by the commandments? That at the age of 13, he's ready, or she is ready, if she's a girl, it's at, at the age of 12, they're ready to take on responsibility for themselves, for their own actions. At the age of 20, whether it's a man or a woman, doesn't matter, it's, a, it's the same thing, the person can take on responsibility for the community, for what's beyond them. It can be a family, which is already beyond, and that's the age. The person should wed at the age of 18. By the time he's 20, she's 20, they probably have a child. So it's already a family. Sometimes they even have two children. It could be a full family. They're ready to take on responsibility that's beyond them. That's what it means to be in a state of mind of the masculine intellect, the intellect of wisdom, the intellect of the father principle. It's the ability to take responsibility for the community, for that which is beyond me. So here we see, that's exactly what we have here, that these are called the hosts of the tabernacle with the idea that at the age of 20, when you contribute the half shekel, you become part of the army, as it were. You're you're ready to take on and assume the responsibility for the community. And it can be any type of responsibility. So when we said army, again, it doesn't have to mean actually going to war. It could be, like what we just explained, could be about setting up the encampment in the right way and making sure that everybody has what they need in this encampment that they had in the wilderness. At the age of 13, you're only ready to take on responsibility for yourself. And it's very interesting that most people know that there's a bar mitzvah, but they don't celebrate the age of 20 as the age of taking on responsibility or being able to take on responsibility for the community. But that's how you need to explain it to young people. When you reach the age of 20, you're no longer just responsible for yourself. You're responsible for your community, for your neighborhood, for your extended family, whatever it is. You're ready to assume that type of responsibility, which is the higher type. So with this, we'll end today. Thanks for joining Hope to see you tomorrow. All the best.